Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar titled Living with the Taliban, uh, which will focus on local communities' previous experience with the Taliban in Afghanistan and the roles of the national police prior to the takeover of Taliban. My name is Ingrid Magnas Jelsvik, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Norwegian Police University College in Oslo uh, and at the University of Oslo as well. Um, and I will be the moderator of this webinar on behalf of the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and in International Crime. The consortium consists of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI, the Norwegian Defence Research Establishment, FFI, the Police University College, PHS, and the Centre for Research on Extremism, CIRIX. In today's webinar, our two invited speakers will shed light on the recent events in Afghanistan by looking at some central factors leading up to today's situation and discuss some future security challenges, focusing particularly on local communities and the role of the police. And as we have seen the past few weeks, the news have been filled with disturbing images and seeds of panic from Afghanistan. And the swift takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban took the world by surprise but it was nevertheless not completely unexpected. Both Afghans and the international community are now uncertain on how the new regime will manage to take on the task of running a country and ensuring human security for its people. So today, the speakers will provide us with some insights into the diversity of experience of local communities with the Taliban in the past. Um, and we'll also discuss the police reform and the work that's been going on with the national police in Afghanistan, which was heavily supported by the international community. And we'll look at how it looked um, prior to the Taliban takeover and discuss the future role and whether there is a future role for the national police under Taliban. So I'm very pleased to present our two speakers today, Professor Ingrid Nyborg and Dr. Surendra Sharma. Ingrid Nyborg is an associate professor at the Department of International Environment and Devel Development Studies at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. She has 30 years of research experience, experience in Africa and South Asia, um, with the last 15 years focusing on livelihood security, post-conflict and post-crisis development in Pakistan and Afghanistan. She recently completed a five-year uh, EU Horizon uh, 2020 research project, Community-Based Policing and Post-Conflict Police Reform, uh, which is a global study of 12 case countries where she led a team of 35 international researchers studying alternative non-militarized forms of policing and processes of trust and uh, building relations between police and communities. We also have Surendra Sharma. He is a retired inspector general from India with close to 40 years of policing experience, including 15 years as a senior capacity building expert, chief technical advisor, and senior police advisor in several UN peacekeeping missions and UNDP. He implemented community-based policing in East Timor, Sudan, and South Sudan. And he was also a senior police advisor with UNDP in Kabul from 2017 to 2020. Uh, where he worked with the Ministry of Interior, Interior and the Afghan National Police to develop, to develop an Afghan-led, owned and sustained model for implementation in Kabul by UNDP. The program of today's webinar is as follows. Uh, Ingrid will start off by giving a 15 minutes presentation based on her research and work in Afghan communities, before Surendra Sharma will present his insights from his work and experience with the Afghan National Police. Um, they'll both present for 15 minutes and after that we will have um, a Q&A session uh, and for those in the audience uh, please send in your questions uh, to the presenters at any time during the seminar in the Q&A uh, box that you can find here in Teams. Um, lastly, I, I just want to note that the seminar will be recorded and uploaded and made available at NUPI's YouTube channel and also at the consortium website. Uh, so you can uh, see it again if you want to or send a link to other people if, uh, if you want to, um, to spread the word. So without further ado, I am very pleased to give the floor to our two speakers and we'll start off with the presentation from Ingrid. So warm welcome to Ingrid. Ingrid, the floor <laughs> is yours. <laughs> thank you, Ingrid. In Ingrid, <laughs> close to me the same. Well, thank you very much for a nice introduction and uh, thank you very much for inviting me also to, to talk today. 
Um, uh, we know that there's a lot happening, obviously, in Afghanistan now. And uh, I came to the point where I think with this seminar was not to repeat everything that's kind of being said in the papers, and and uh, but uh, but to really maybe look back and see what has been going on in, in communities in Afghanistan uh, over the over the past years. And so I will give perspectives, you know, from my last 15 years or so working with livelihood security and community police. Uh, 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 community-oriented police reform. So, um, first, as you as you mentioned, I mean, the Taliban has been sliding into communities for a very long time. Uh, also, during our research in uh, livelihood security, way back in 2005, 2006, when we started. And I want to start by just saying there's been a lot of really good work going on in the communities in Afghanistan. They've had a very extensive national solidarity program, uh, which was a government run program, which really reached out to most communities in, in Afghanistan, giving resources and providing, you know, uh, 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 developing more kind of democratic versions of the Shura and uh, and uh, implementing uh, development projects where also women have been really quite active even is either in their own uh, uh, committees or together with men in some of the communities so this has actually been quite extensive so this uh, this is something that's already quite different uh, from when the last time the taliban were in power um, so it's not only in the cities where women have had a a, a different position uh, in, in Afghanistan, it's also in rural communities. Um, but of course, it's very different how that has been implemented. Um, but there's two parts of that program that I'd like to just kind of mention here um, that was uh, a bit um, a shame that it wasn't uh, uh, considered earlier in that program. And one was that it was very community based, which is very, of course, a good thing. Um, but it took a long time for uh, the to, for the international community to actually really support the levels that are just above the community. So while communities were there creating a kind of a de democratic demand uh, uh, for improving their their lives, when they went to the district levels, it was only after some time that they started having district uh, uh, development committees and these kind of more district and also at the provincial level was qu still quite far and the processes that were happening there were not really connected. So you had a, a, a situation where this demand was coming up to try to get some services by the government and they were not able to provide them and they did not provide them. At the same time, money was coming in and, and this was kind of forming a base for corruption. Uh, so, so this was one uh, bit of a shame that that system was kind of not really capitalized on early on when, when community development was, was actually being developed. And the other part was also quite unfor unfortunate and that is that when this national solidarity program started, uh, it was actually this is a, this is a government program that was supported by NGOs, but it was also suggested at the beginning that uh, community based policing was also a part of it. So the police would be a part of this kind of uh, community building process and the international community did, was not interested in this, so it was not implemented. It was changed and we see now uh, an after sight or whatever that we, we that would probably would have been a very good idea to include that in this more community development programs. So um, it was a bit kind of a, we might say a wasted opportunity. Uh, a second point I, I thought I would bring up was actually to really exemplify a bit of the, uh, the level of frustration uh, uh, in the communities by those who, who were marginalized in this development process. Um, and um, one example, I just I want to tell a small story from uh, Daikundi where we were doing research there was that at some point in Daikundi there were a lot of development projects uh, in different districts. At one point, uh, one of the, the warlords uh, uh, in one of the districts that uh, was not being covered by development, they uh, kidnapped a, a bunch of police and their vehicles and caused a bit of commotion and, and got a lot of attention. Uh, and when the uh, district commissioner uh, decided he would try to solve this issue uh, locally. This was a young guy. He was very uh, well educated and uh, and very motivated and 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 wrote, drove around on his motorcycle to all the villages to 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 kind of visit and see what was going on. He uh, initiated a peace process in the area where they met all the communities, came together. They met men and women also to discuss what the grievances were, what were the problems, and uh, made. Um, it turns out there were two main issues. One was that this um, 
this one area felt left out. They were not included in the government, although in, during elections they had gotten some support. And the, and the fact that there was no, no development going on in their area, in their districts. So they, uh, and then the governor, like they would explain, well, like maybe, okay, if there's going to be development, you have to stop attacking people. It has to be safe for people to work there. And so there was a whole discussion. They ended up with a lot of uh, uh, actions that could be done uh, in, to improve the situation and keep peace. They went to the provincial level nothing. They were not interested at all in doing it. So you had this amazing process at the local level, came up in the system and there's nothing. And not too long after there were huge uh, uh, accusations of corruption at that provincial level for the governor. I mean, there's like just a lot, a lot going on there. So a bit frustrating. And there's many other stories, but that I thought that kind of illustrated a bit about how, how, um, how even with good things happening, this issue of, of corruption was, is actually quite uh, detrimental <laughs> to say the least. And, uh, and so it's not surprising then after so many years of the failure of the government to uh, provide resources and to support local processes uh, that uh, the Taliban kind of was able to again slide into different communities. And, uh, and this was really very widespread. And so, but on the other hand, this gave the local communities an opportunity uh, to negotiate as well. So many of the communities where the Taliban were coming in, uh, they were in one sense forced to, to negotiate uh, uh, with the Taliban to be able to function to in whatever they were doing. And in some areas, even in some very conservative areas, the women were, were negotiating directly with the Taliban to keep midwifery schools open, to be, keep teaching, keep social services going. So there has there is a lot of experience Experience in many, many, many communities in, in negotiating with the Taliban. Now that uh, that may be the Taliban, um, local Taliban. Uh, probably now we see uh, different uh, types of Taliban in the communities. There may be some foreign fighters, and and it's very difficult maybe to get that same kind of negotiations going on. And of course, the Taliban have total control. They don't really have to negotiate on their side uh, as much as they did. But that's that's uh, another issue. But um, so, it's, but it's at least it's probably the the way that uh, women could negotiate with the Taliban earlier. Uh, it's probably limited. Now I have to turn my page here, and it's not turning. There we go. <laughs> um, the third point. I just have a, a, a final point. Um, is that um, uh, it moves on to a little bit of the policing part that uh, so my colleague Serenda will go into more detail of, and and that is that. Um, you know, there has been in recent years a, a lot of effort in community-based policing in, in terms of, of the police reform in, in Afghanistan. And um, they, uh, these, of course, there, there, and there was a lot of progress in getting communities and police to discuss together. They used uh, uh, NGOs to help them to create fora where to facilitate discussions on what the issues were how they could approach them, have action plans, build trust, all of these things. Um, but again, um, the and, and these and community and community oriented policing was something that came uh, quite, uh, quite in a sense relatively late in the in the process of, uh, of reform. Uh, and um, it's uh, which is again unfortunate um, because the, it, if they had in the sense started much earlier with this, it would have been a, a little bit different issue. But nevertheless, um, no matter what is being done, we see some of the same issues as with community development issues with the N NSP program is that uh, the, the, the police can, can only do what they can do within this uh, larger picture of corruption. So if they are not able to arrest and prosecute in the uh, people who are, are committing crimes, um, you know they are they're not uh, that it just they have a lot of impunity in the system then their hands are basically tied so they can be the nicest uh, people to discuss the issue, local issues but at some point their power and and their uh, their competence is just you know put a lid on so uh, so the danger um, here i mean right now of course they've all disappeared and i i don't think that uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not surrender, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that, um, uh, the, 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 fortunately they have, uh, they have uh, received training, but they're, they're in hiding. And what the, that's what this will mean. We know, we don't know what's going to happen, of course, with 
with the government and the Taliban, how long it will last, if this will be something that will be for a long time. But we, what we have actually are a whole lot of, of uh, police officers who have been trained in, in more community uh, policing. And uh, uh, there is, uh, of course, the biggest danger in this sense would be that the policing will be taken over by somebody completely different and it will not be community focused in the same way. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think um, that is kind of what I wanted to say is that uh, a lot of these processes have been developing for a long time. The frustrations there, the corruption is there. None of this is, is, is new, but uh, I think it's important to remember uh, and to, to the trends in community development that actually have been ha happening. And that is a different uh, world than it was when the Taliban was in, in charge before. So this idea of who will be negotiating with the Taliban in the communities, um, see that was done without a central uh, Taliban focus in Kabul. So what will happen now? Um, uh, is what is is quite um, you know we, we we don't know but it's not like completely blank in that way there has been this discussion and so who uh, of course a lot of the news is not very good about what's happening in in, in many communities but um, but time will tell yeah I think that now we <laughs> I was being really quick and we lost Surendra <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we have some problems with the with the connection to uh, to Surendra. But then I would like to um, just uh, take this opportunity to say, because you um, you mentioned um, uh, community policing a, a lot uh, in your presentation and the role of community policing, and uh, some of the people in our audience don't uh, necessarily might not necessarily know what communities policing is and what it might look like in Afghanistan. So maybe we should just uh, take this opportunity to say a couple of words of that while we're waiting for the Surendra to come back in. Right, right. OK, well, I can say a few words and I maybe he uh, hopefully I won't take away what he's going to say. But mm. uh, community policing, community, we call it actually community oriented policing or community based policing, which is a policing that where police and communities get together. There is like a joint definition of problems. There's there's uh, trust building and and uh, uh, a, more of a collaboration, whereas the old kind of way of thinking of community policing is more using the community as informants. And uh, <clears throat> that has kind of been the the norm, uh, at least in also in Afghanistan, where there hasn't really been a strong police earlier, but still it mostly is based on a state police and uh, a, a police that is protecting the security of the state and it's using the communities to, uh, to gather uh, intelligence uh, on on crimes and and whatever, so this different form of community oriented policing is more of a collaboration between police and communities where they work together also uh, also in crime prevention, and uh, and so it's a much more kind of equal trust building relationship. And in Afghanistan, um, this uh, this started. Uh, uh, kind of, uh, it was quite sidelined at the beginning. Uh, of, there have always been, in a sense, processes uh, towards trying to get a community police uh, uh, program going, but uh, but it was not supported by the Ministry of Interior at first. At the beginning of of uh, you know at, after the peace process, there was a very strong um, uh, Ministry of Interior that was, of course, it's always also very military based as a ministry where there's generals running. Um, you know, running the, the ministry at, at many levels. And so the idea of community-based policing was not really uh, not really uh, interesting for them. There was a, a lot of talk about the Afghan local police supporting local militias and a, a, a very strong kind of uh, militarization of the police in the beginning years, which is not unusual in post-conflict police reform. We see this in, in, in many of the countries that we studied in this in this uh, EU project. Not you in, in the US well <laughs> mm. <laughs> so uh, so this kind of the thought that you had to have a kind of a militarized approach after a conflict in policing um, was kind of the the mantra at the beginning but uh, this eventually changed and not just because the international community came in in Afghanistan there were a lot of local efforts to try to get community policing community-based policing into uh, the ministry and a lot of very uh, like police activists uh, that were trying to get it. And actually as it went on and as the international community finally 
came around and and decided yes community-based policing was uh, interesting and we should support it it also eventually came into the ministry and was institutionalized as a as a, a separate section and there's been a lot of training and in most of the provinces uh, they have then um, started community-oriented policing say sections and and trainings in in pretty much all the provinces so it went from being absolutely nothing maybe just a uh, call line into the police uh, for crimes in Kabul or or uh, so into something that is completely different and that in Afghanistan it was actually quite locally driven they engaged a lot of uh, local NGOs to like make the handbooks and the training materials at the same time they, that was all supported by for example UNDP and and uh, you know a lot of other uh, NGOs oh now he's back okay so they'll <laughs> I'll leave him to say the rest of the story <laughs> Hi, Surendra. Hi, Surendra. Hi. Can you hear us? You're muted. You know. You're, oh. Sorry, there was a glitch. There we go. I missed the last few minutes of Ingrid's uh, presentation. No mm. problem, no problem. It, it's uh, how it is in this uh, digitalized uh, world these days. It happens. Um, so Ingrid, thank you so much for your uh, thoughtful presentation and uh, we'll get back to uh, to some of the points that you raised in the Q&A section uh, later on. Uh, but now that we have Surendra back, um, I'm very pleased that you're here with us uh, now, Surendra, and um, we really look forward to listening to your experiences um, from working with the, with the Afghan police for several years. So Surendra, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Umbul, and uh, at the outset, I would like to apologize for the technical glitch. Uh, it was all of a sudden, uh, but um, it was indeed a pleasure uh, to be invited to interact with uh, such an august uh, audience today. Uh, I would uh, definitely like to share my uh, my experiences in Afghanistan uh, for the last uh, uh, three years, where I was there from 2017 till 2020. Uh, for for uh, most of us, you know, who have been there, actually, the events which have uh, unfolded in the last uh, uh, few months or since August are not unexpected. See, the way things are, uh, you know, for us, uh, we can see that a lot of things done actually by the international community and the things which are perceived to be done were actually uh, more of perception than something really, uh, really on the ground. And especially this is more so in the security sector, especially when we dealt with the army and police. I had a close interaction with the police, both uh, right at the Ministry of Interior level, at the provincial level, and also at uh, at, at the at the grassroots level. And we found, you know, that there were other things uh, which uh, which we thought that we we were doing, but actually there were a lot of gaps which were left uncovered. And I think uh, uh, before I got disconnected, uh, we were talking about the governance gap. I think this is something which is very very evident because uh, the Taliban could take over so quickly and so and uh, and have been um, accepted uh, in especially the rural areas in which the way the the governance has been in the country with years uh, especially disconnect between Kabul and the provinces and and uh, the disconnect between the, the the people on the in the rural areas and the urban areas very obvious in the so you find that they, the Taliban you know once uh, when it comes to uh, their acceptance level at the uh, uh, rural uh, the rural areas is very very high compared to the urban areas. and most of the issues are being raised in the in the urban areas the exodus is from the urban areas but in the rural areas where the people have suffered all these years yet you know the Taliban have been able, able to make big gains and have been, able, have been more or less accepted because um, uh, the, the scenario when it comes to security hasn't changed in the rural areas for these people. It has been the way it has been even when uh, the, the government was there because the government actually never reached those people. Uh, like like you said that it was just like the Ministry of Interior. I know that, they, that probably the writ of the Minister of Interior didn't uh, uh, go beyond his doorstep. And uh, there was a big disconnect between what was happening in Kabul with the provinces and furthermore in the villages. Uh, same went with the with the rule with the rule of law, of, you know, the justice system, and uh, so you see that the the, the the Taliban the acceptance of the Taliban in the rural areas is much 
Human rights and you know these things. They, they were never there in the first place. So you know when it, the way things are defined, that you know uh, at least there is some semblance for law and there is some semblance of justice, so to say, if you can say that. Uh, the, uh, because in any case, they were more accustomed to the traditional form of justice, uh, which they followed in, in the rural areas, which is continuing. So uh, in fact, um, there were reports, you know, that about. Uh, People, uh, the, the truck drivers are actually very, very happy. The little things are uh, the Taliban have come over because they say that the corruption has gone down and people are scared. Earlier we were paying so many, many actually, in fact, I've been there as I'm talking about it. We realized that as much as $6 million was being paid as bribes in, in a week. So, you know, now people say that, you know, that has stopped because people are, uh, you know, scared that the, 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 the Taliban are going to implement the Sharia law. And, uh, and, and as a result of that, things have find the rural areas when it comes to security. So, so these are uh, things which there's a big divide between the urban and the rural areas when it comes to security issues. And, uh, and we find that, you know, those are issues which need to be tackled as such. You know, in the rural areas, we find that people, a lot of people who are educated, who have worked with international communities, who have uh, exposure, are the ones who are actually facing the brunt of uh, the changeover. And they are the ones who are leaving the country and leaving uh, into other places. But when it comes to rural areas, they realize that things haven't changed. Another, another thing which I find is, um, really uh, striking is to see there is not a single uh, perhaps there may not be a single family uh, in in uh, especially those who have been working with the police or from the army who have not actually lost family members or have not suffered at the hands of the taliban and uh, yet they have accepted the taliban you see that is something uh, you see that this perhaps you know underlines the gap the governance gap which was there uh, we feel that you know, uh, the, despite losing people, despite being killed by the Taliban, uh, they are uh, more well, sort of, um, uh, obviously, obviously, at the same time, even the Shias, you know, who have been at the forefront when it comes to you know, all sorts of attacks. But even there, the leaders, uh, you know, there have been the reports that the leaders of Sharia have also accepted uh, or have made peace with the Taliban in certain levels. So those are issues which we find that when it comes to security issues, uh, the, the scenario is very different from the urban and the rural areas and the Taliban uh, who are there now. There's very little difference between what they were or what they were practicing when they were earlier than now. Uh, perhaps, you know, now we find that uh, the most of the he is uh, in one list of the terrorism, the U.S. list of terrorism. Yeah, uh, so those are the, the, the fact that uh, these are people who are uh, who have been um, proclaimed as a, a terrorist in the UN list and yet are uh, you know ruling the roost and yet you know the the people find them to be acceptable in the rule that is something which uh, speaks volumes about the kind of governance which the country has had over the last two decades that is something which uh, you know uh, i think when it comes to security uh, would be interesting to see as, as things uh, unfold uh, I would now like to build, uh, you know, something about the policing part in you know, the police reform. That is something uh, which is very, very interesting in the sense that it's perhaps one of the biggest police reform uh, program which has ever been launched in the world. Uh, the, the, the kind of resources, the kind of expertise, the kind of, uh, you know, opportunities which are available, the kind of agencies who were involved in, in police reform was the environment. I mean, we had everything. And uh, and yet, you know, the kind of results which were expected. So there obviously there was something which was uh, not being done the way it should have been done to achieve the desired results. The the first fact is that you know we were all uh, the fact we were talking to police and the army, but actually there was no police and there was no army. There was a people of the police was never considered like as a career in the in the AMP. Uh, and then you find that people were just being. Uh, sent by uh, warlords and, and uh, they belong to certain tribes and you know they were just asked to wear the uniform they just were asked they just knew how to use the gun and that's it 
and and uh, the international community was paying them, so it was an opportunity to get paid two hundred dollars a month, and at the same time gave them a uniform and a gun, and gave them an opportunity to even perhaps earn more money by standing on the road, mm -hmm. you know, during the day. Like it's been reported widely that police were themselves a big source of insecurity and corruption, you know, in in, uh, in the last two decades. So and then here is the an international community which has you know the best possible experts available on the ground, and and you know we had the resources and everything and equipment and interest structure and everything, trying to reform this band of people to become an international or to become a police, a democratically oriented police or a civilian police, which was looking at human rights, looking at women rights and looking at, you know, protecting people and property. And, uh, so perhaps, you know, there was a need to reform the international expectations more than to reform the police. <laughs> and also at the same time, I feel that, you know, we need to, uh, you know, the, the international approach to reform was perhaps also needs to be reformed. Uh, the, the basic idea was that you know, uh, you see, you had all you had the U.S., you had you know the NATO countries, and you had other individual countries you know, who were actually uh, conducting uh, this kind of you know an extensive reform programs, police reform programs in different parts of the country, and uh, uh, and then trying to address issues in their own way. Unfortunately, you know, we were trying to address a problem, an Afghan problem, in a European way or in a, in a you know. Asian way or in a, in a US way and all that and and we ended up doing that as a result of that there was uh, the uh, we ended up training a whole lot of people on paper and we ended up training uh, and uh, providing infrastructure and equipment and uh, a lot of uh, things which look good on paper but actually nothing changed on the ground for the people for the, the, the police actually uh, you know is supposed to be helping the people and protecting the people and the property which is not happening in this case so, the, so the, the what I realized that there perhaps there was a shit lack of shared vision. You know, we didn't share a uh, vision with the Afghan people. And at the same time, we were trying to uh, look at it in a very narrow, truncated way. We were just looking at the police. We are not looking at the justice or the entire criminal justice sector as a sector itself in a holistic way. So that even if we ended up reforming the police by magic, ultimately, you know, where would they, uh, all the people who would be arrested end? You need, you need a justice system. So that itself was lacking, you know. There was a traditional justice system which was also functional, but which was not getting the recognition it was uh, it was expected to get. So the the entire uh, there were a lot of gaps in the entire criminal justice system. So that is something which uh, was very really much uh, lacking in the police form. At the same time, we were trying to transform people who were absolutely illiterate, who were illiterate, who were on contract, who had no motivation of any kind. Or uh, to to join uh, the police service. It was not a career like I mentioned. The privates were on contract. They were just being sent by the warlords to join the police for a particular time, and they remained in the police as long as the warlord wanted them to be. And uh, yet, you know, the, the what really intrigues me is that the, it's not that the international community and the donors were not aware of what uh, was happening or what was there on the ground, and yet we kept on you know, uh, pumping money, pumping resources, pumping all sorts of things without actually addressing the issues which uh, to my mind were fundamental. Like, like uh, instead of, you know, uh, uh, pumping resources and trying to transform illiterate, addicted people into, uh, you know, mm -hmm. policemen or, or some sort of, a, you know, uh, a professional person, it would have been better to uh, find uh, or reform the recruitment process and recruit people, uh, young people. There, it was not, that there was no dearth of, you see, there was a big difference between the previous Taliban time and now uh, in the last two decades. There were thousands of young men and women in Afghanistan who were highly trained, educated, who were available, who wanted to join police or, or, or uh, as a career. Unfortunately, they were sidelined and we kept on pumping money on uh, trying to transform people uh, who were related. I mean, we were, we were talking about teaching cyber crime. We were talking of, uh, you know, we, the international community was providing computers and all sorts of things to people who are related. They couldn't even write their own names. So the whole idea was, you know, uh, the, the entire approach appeared to be very, very, uh, and there's, the reasons are not far to seek in the sense that there were so many uh, actors involved and everybody had their own uh, mandate and everybody wanted to actually implement that mandate without taking into consideration the bigger picture. So ultimately a national uh, picture of a national police service was lacking. And as a result of that, you know, we ended up doing things in our own way and, you know, we patted ourselves on the back, we came thousands of people and we did this, but the net result was virtually a zero. And then that's what was evident on the run. So, but, but of course, 
Uh, and there are so, a lot of things which we can discuss and go on and on. And, you know, this is a favorite topic. The <laughs> building myself, we've been discussed as an island. I would like to just uh, take a few more minutes and tell you what, what you know, the, the possible role can be in this scenario. It's not that everything is lost. I, I said in the beginning that, you know, mm -hmm. yes, a lot of people have gone and, and, and a lot of people who've been trained all over the uh, world, you know, in, in, as police officers have gone, uh, they left the country and all that. But at the same time, we have still have a lot of people who have undergone training. We still have a lot of infrastructure which has been created, fantastic infrastructure, which is as good as anywhere in the world. And uh, we have a lot of equipment which have been provided. People have been trained on that equipment. So it's just a question of, you know, getting the right kind of opportunity. And if uh, that opportunity comes, uh, I, I think that, you know, we can leverage on, on the efforts which have been made uh, over these past two decades, you know, and see how these can actually be a result. And like what uh, Ingrid was uh, mentioning, you know, that community oriented policing, perhaps in this scenario, the most relevant thing which can actually happen is community oriented policing. Why? Because it is not rocket science. It's not something which involves every policeman doesn't have to investigate. Every policeman doesn't have to be James Bond. You know, he, everybody, because policing is best, uh, it's protecting lives, protecting property and uh, traffic. A whole lot of things in the police service are actually, uh, can easily be done by people who have common sense. And community oriented policing is one thing which has struck roots in, uh, even in the rural areas. It, because the uh, Germans, I remember, they did a very good job in the north. And we in UNDP, we were trying to do something in the Kabul and other places. And other agencies were also involved where a whole lot of communities were actually participating, including women. So, you know, that that expertise is there. It's not that everybody has gone away. So, and then the, the, the best part is that, you know, in case in uh, community policing, you don't have to be a professional police guy. Basically, it's just interacting with the police and trying to find local solutions to security related problems, which you can do. So, you know, in the scenario which we are in now, if we say that, okay, and everybody will become educated and the Taliban will start respecting human rights and women's rights <laughs> and all. So, I mean, that is something which we have no control over. But at the same time, the possibility is, I think, for the international community is that you know, those people who have been trained, maybe they have been in, in different pockets and but all over the country, mm -hmm. and the communities who have been exposed to this kind of, uh, you know, policing, uh, I think uh, they can always, uh, you know, when the time comes, they can, the dots can be joined and, you know, we can find a way of actually see, uh, seeing how they can actually contribute to the safety and security of the people. I, I think I'll stop there mm -hmm. and uh, I think I've also taken extra time because I have the technical <laughs> problems, but, uh, but uh, I would like to uh, take any questions. Which, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Surendra, for that presentation. And unfortunately, we were having some uh, some technical problems, so, uh, so really sorry for that um, in terms of connection. So it's a bit hard to hear you in the beginning, and and your screen froze a bit. But I think we're doing doing better <laughs> at the moment. So we'll just uh, we'll just hold on to, to what we have. Um, uh, and sort of some of the main. Um, main points that I think was really, really interesting that you draw out was that um, that the vision was not common in terms of of uh, what the police were supposed to do and be and what sort of service they were supposed to to provide um, and that there was um, uh, sort of differences in the in the expectations or, or yeah, I really like what you said about the about uh, an international reform in terms of expectations uh, when it came to the international community coming in and and um, and doing doing training and working with the uh, with Afghan um, police. Uh, so thank you so much for um, to both of you for for this really interesting presentations. And then I would like to uh, remind the audience again that you um, are able to send in your questions to both the presenters. Uh, in the Q&A chat function. So please send in your questions um, uh, to us and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, um, we'll have them at the end. Um, but first, I would like to, uh, to take the opportunity and ask some of the questions that I have <laughs> and be some, a bit of my position here. Because um, there's a lot to, uh, to draw out from, uh, from both of your um, uh, presentations. Um, and I would like to uh, discuss uh, a couple of points that that's come up. Um, but I think to start off, um, 
it was uh, it's been reported uh, that many in many many areas where the Taliban um, has uh, has now entered has been given a warm welcome by the local communities that they have been uh, warmly welcomed and, and invited in um, and if you could say a bit about what kind of strategies have they had to 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 get that sort of a relationship with the local communities uh, and if you think they'll be able to maintain that over time uh, as the situation is now how will that uh, go forward you think very open question <laughs> <laughs> uh, i mean i i find it just have a thought um, that I, I, I'm wondering, you know, again, it, I think it comes down to the the inability of the government to provide services and to be so corrupt. And when people have to pay and pay for every service, they have to pay to get a job, they have to pay to get any service in a sense. And uh, whereas, uh, you know, then it's uh, it's an easy, <laughs> easy job in one sense for Taliban to come in and say they have a better alternative. And uh, it, it kind of, like you say, I think it's very different in different parts of the country, but but of course, um, if, if the Taliban has been listening to some of this and then responding through, uh, for example, uh, that uh, corruption, you know, in, in a different way, then of course that's, that's it's such a huge thing for people in people's lives that, that if they're able to, to latch on to only that, uh, I mean, we saw that people it didn't. It, maybe they don't like want the Taliban, but the, the government was not there either. So, in a sense, mm. it was not. They weren't. They kind of dug their own grave in one way. The the, the government by not going after this corruption, and uh, in one sense. And but this is also somewhat what one heard uh, the last time the Taliban came over. There was also a lot of support for the Taliban then as well by many and that was exactly the same thing they were saying is that it was corrupt you know society was so corrupt so it seems that the the Taliban is able to somehow uh, convince uh, that they have an alternative uh, and uh, yeah uh, so I, I and again I think this has been sliding and again they latch on to people who are who have been marginalized and uh, they they kind of build them up and they had this kind of system going for a long time so um, yeah, I mean that was that's just my take yeah. on it. If I can add, you know, I think the individuals covered most of the point, but I realize that you see the uh, governance is of course the big gap in governance is one point. The second point is that people want solutions, and the solutions you know were not coming. And here is, uh, for example, in rural areas especially. There were land disputes, there were family disputes, there were other disputes. People, another thing is that they uh, were more accustomed to sorting out those problems uh, through traditional means. And those traditional means, through mullahs and you know, the, the local elders and all that, they, they actually will get a lot of clout in those areas. And though uh, it's an accepted way of uh, doing business, you know. So when it comes, and, and that's what Taliban are doing. So it's something which the, which the rural folk easily relate to. It's not that you know uh, this was uh, or people were going to courts when uh, the uh, regular government was there. It, it was not the case. Most of the problems were still being solved by the elders and by the religious heads and mullahs and others. So it's just a question of you know uh, giving more sort of uh, strength to this system which was already existing. So people realize that okay, the, you know the problems are being solved and uh, there's less corruption. Like uh, it will mention the base. And the most important thing is that. If, the, the system uh, functions and uh, there is uh, immediate justice, whatever it is right or wrong. Or, or, you know, the, the fact is that there is some law, whatever law which is acceptable, even if it's Sharia, because you know, Sharia, okay, but it is implemented and there is rights. And that's, uh, I think that is something which is appealing to the people and that's why you find that people have, that, like I mentioned, it's really, uh, you know, surprising in the sense that a lot of people from the ANP and the army have lost people who have died fighting the Taliban. And yet, they are ready to welcome the Taliban. Shias, they are ready to welcome the Taliban. Why? Because they find that, you know, this is something, okay, they've lost people and all that, but at the same time, they see some ray of hope that at least they can live in with some security and they can, there is some law and order or some, you know, semblance of uh, business which they can do in this environment. So I think that is what perhaps one of the reasons why they are welcome. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm wondering also, uh, is that, of course, people are, are, They've had to deal with the change in in government over several decades, and uh, 
and in a sense, they uh, we found the same thing. I also did study in in the Swat Valley, Pakistan. It's like something similar is that families they maybe will send one son to work for the army, one for the police, one for the Taliban. There's like you know they will in a sense you know guard themselves about any situation that's coming up. So they're very I think they can be very strategic and very careful about being so vocal when uh, in during this last period, the last decade and a half of of the Taliban coming in, they were the nevertheless careful about you know being taking one stance or the other when they are there uh, and I think that's a uh, from their experience that makes a lot of sense for them uh, so in a sense you maybe and when you say support to the Taliban yes I mean again because what's the alternative so mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that we'll have we'll see a lot um, we'll see how this develops uh, because this is a new situation also like I was saying the fact that the Taliban has a central kind of authority now a voice that is trying to to make decisions on what Sharia is and then you have these local Taliban which have been negotiating the whole time about what they think Taliban or uh, Sharia looks like uh, locally uh, I mean how these will play together we really don't know I mean, how how will that work? Will it work at all, or will the entire thing disintegrate? An alternative is that maybe okay, if it's working, maybe like in maybe you have a Iran, you have like the a development of like two police. You have the moral police and you have the regular mm -hmm. police, in a sense. Like so, so what's going to happen in the communities? Are they going to? Because I think that uh, of course maybe the Taliban has less experience in regular issues. Uh, in in development issues in in uh, the the business of running a state or, de, or or a community, so they will need other people. So so how will that be? Uh, how will that be in practice? Will they give up some of this control in some areas and keep them in others? And what that what will that negotiation look like now? And now since we know that there's a humanitarian crisis, of course, in Afghanistan, and this is building up, and the international community is finally finding. Uh, some uh, some I uh, are saying yes we understand we have to come in with with uh, aid now to to avoid a tremendous crisis in Afghanistan now that the winter is coming and um, and but then uh, and there is of course a lot of uh, concern about giving money to the Taliban and 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 that that kind of support however uh, there is also as you say there has been support going into uh, the communities of Afghanistan in many ways in in uh, through organizations or even like through the government for development for emer uh, for emergency aid also those uh, the, that kind of infrastructure and uh, is still there in one sense so so it, uh, it's not I would say it's less risky to actually give this money to, to use some of these to invest in some of this humanitarian aid as an opportunity to engage with the in a sense that discussions with the local Taliban from a position of of, uh, of giving assistance, you know, in a sense, and, and then a sense of, to people and practicing this humanitarian aid may in itself be an opportunity to have better negotiations with the Taliban about how that aid should be, you know, distributed, organized, uh, you know, how that could happen uh, in ways that are in fact less corrupt than they maybe have been in the past. Mm. So it could be rather than a, a risk in the sense that it's talked about on a higher level, at the national level, this could actually be an opportunity to engage with the practice, uh, through the practice of humanitarian aid in a way to see really what's going on and, and perhaps be able to influence um, uh, the ability of local communities to negotiate themselves, negotiate a better relationship with the Taliban. So that's something that might happen. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Although we don't know <laughs> how uh, much faith we have in, in how things will go is is really quite debatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. And 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 uh, what is happening with the with the national police uh, uh, these days? Uh, I think one of you mentioned that uh, some have gone into to hiding. Uh, so where are we now with the with the national police? What's going on? Uh, we know? Well, uh, <laughs> as for the person who I've been talking to his national colleagues, but most of the, like all the police stations, uh, they have been taken over by the Taliban. So they are the ones who are actually now patrolling the streets. They are the one who are sitting in the police stations. They are the one who have taken over all the ministries. And you know, so ultimately, uh, the, the security is totally in their hands. And like you said, the national police, 
uh, most of them were just wearing the uniform. Otherwise, uh, now they're not wearing the uniform. So uh, I, I, I don't see that, uh, you know, that kind of a organization which was there where people were posted in police stations were actually continuing and nothing of that sort uh, is there on the ground as such. So it will be, uh, and I don't know how many of them will come back because earlier uh, they were, like I said, they were, we called them the national police, but actually I don't know how far they were actually the police because most of them, you know, were um, steeped in tribalism and, and, you know, they were from certain, they were actually owing allegiance to certain warlords or whatever. So, you know, it, basically it was that all of them were being, being paid $200 a month. So it was, you know, a profitable business to make the family, you know, make uh, both ends meet, you know, with the, of the family. So you get $200 a month from the international community and that's all. But then when it comes to motivation, when it comes to actually doing any professional police work, they were lacking. So at this juncture, I don't see, you know, uh, they are just probably waiting and watching. And then and the Taliban, in any case, have taken over all the, uh, the, the entire institutions which were functional. So um, at this juncture, they uh, I don't know where they would be and uh, how long it will take them or uh, how long it will take for them to actually come back or uh, now there are instances where the people have been called the Taliban have been calling people who have been working for the government to actually come back but at the same time I know of colleagues who have actually been persecuted uh, who are being the research has been carried out from you know house doors and uh, people mm -hmm. are being identified the two who have been working with the national communities and all that so I right. think it's, uh, it's slightly early to see you know how things are actually going to actually pan out it will take some more time you know when things stabilize and uh, this government I mean so to see mm -hmm. the government here how it starts implementing what it plans to do so that is something it's not that you know like you gave the example of Iran in Sudan also you know we they had Sharia and we were there but it was very strictly implemented but again they had different they had community police and mm -hmm. uh, you know the regular police, the community police was like the moral police. So, so but then people accepted it in the sense that it was a way of life, and people accepted it, and it was uh, you know implemented by the government across the board. So, it is something which uh, is uh, what will have to be seen. You know, is how uh, all these whatever they are planning to do is actually implemented on the ground. But now, see at this juncture, this is just free for all. Everybody is mm -hmm. trying to do whatever they feel like. You see, the women are being flogged on the road, and, and uh, all sorts of things are happening. Uh, you know, so mm -hmm. there is there doesn't seem to be any control. Earlier, you know, there was it appeared as if okay, the command and control was poor, fine. But at the same time, there was some sort of a you know somebody hierarchy in the in the service where people would listen to somebody. But at this juncture, it's a free for all. You know, so it will take some time. Huh? Uh, for things to civilize and then even if they have this kind of a police, I mean, basically there's very little difference between, see, when it comes to training and other things, uh, what the Taliban are doing and what the regular police were doing. So it's it's not that they were better trained or less trained. Uh, uh, basically, the stock is the same. You know? mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you for that. Um... And I also wanted to ask uh, both of you, because um, you talked about it a little bit about the international community and and uh, and the role that um, the international community has played in in Afghanistan in terms of uh, uh, giving a lot of training, uh, a lot of support, and many argue that there's been a lot of resources going into to the <laughs> to the international uh, communities. Um, uh, presence in, in Afghanistan. And of course, um, well, what we have seen uh, from other countries is that um, often local context uh, is not really properly taken into consideration um, when in programs are implemented on the ground, when police reform is uh, implemented on the ground, when community policing is, is tried to, to establish. And it seems like it's uh, from your presentations that it's uh, a bit of the same issue here. But I was wondering if you could elaborate uh, a bit on that and, and, and possibly say what should have been done differently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with hindsight <laughs> in hindsight which is always easier to say <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i don't know if uh, uh Sudan has seemed to have frozen again <laughs> oh no yeah but um i mean 
again, like we said, we, the international community did support police reform at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, um, the focus was not uh, at community level, or the focus was was more of uh, more of training at community level for being more like soldiers, basically. You know, taking them out uh, for the communities, training them to shoot, putting them back, in a sense, and not really, um, not really in policing. So the trend of training has changed, uh, you know, over over time, and that was a good move on the international community's part to make this focus more on community policing. And it was, in fact, in fact, UNAMA played a very strong role in in uh, pushing uh, towards community-based policing in police reform processes by uh, funding a lot of uh, small pilot projects on uh, putting uh, civil society together with police and, and having this interaction and developing some experience where they could sell it into uh, the ministry. So I think, unfortunately, the focus of the, the international community and funding has, has maybe not been there. Uh, it has been a bit slow in taking up uh, that that focus towards community-based policing, but but in the end, it actually was a very strong focus, as Surendra can then tell. I mean, community policing has been; uh, they've realized that that is actually where uh, where they should have been, uh, and and uh, it was not um, uh, in practice. Uh, it was not not the case at the beginning. Although the who say I must say the Germans had, had tried uh, a bit in in a little bit different way, but uh, but it hasn't. And so the the focus on capacity building in policing and community policing hmm. uh, is is one that I think uh, Surenda, now that you're back, you can say some more on. That's that's never a that's never a loss. I mean, if there had been um, uh, the, all of the investment in training and in training a police uh, to look at community uh, community issues, uh, is it was a very good investment, uh, and I think that now uh, we don't, like I say, we don't know what's going to happen and what's going to happen. If they're going to try to build up the police again, the danger would be that if it's a very strong Taliban with a very strong Sharia law, that policing will be a state police in a sense, looking at state issues again and and, and completely move away from what the trend was beforehand, and that would be uh, quite a shame in a sense. Um, but if they were uh, to somehow if the situation was such that uh, they were reinstating a lot of uh, government workers and including the police, those police that they would reinstate have a different training. They have a training that is more towards communities. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, a, in a sense, a better starting point than maybe it was uh, when the Taliban took over last time. So there would be a different discussion on what security issues and what are in the communities now that these people have, have been functioning somewhat within a corrupt uh, world, but, you know, trained uh, to to do things differently. Yeah, I, I fully agree with what you is saying, because you see, perhaps in, in the given environment in which we were operating, you know, uh, where majority of the police were illiterate, they had, you know, different levels of training, officers were trained differently, NCOs were trained differently, Come, uh, the privates were not trained or trained for one week or whatever, you know, and they were, there were so many challenges. So in, in that scenario, expecting the police to perform as a regular police, as a professional police service as such, was I think we were expecting too much. So, but in that environment, what do we do? We don't wait for you know people to become educated overnight. They can't become educated overnight. They can't become professionals overnight. It's a long drawn process. It's a step by step process. It it takes long. Somewhere I was reading, you see them British expert as it will take 30 years for uh, the country to develop a professional police service. But, but the, the point is that in what do we do in that kind of a scenario? The, the best thing which could have been done in this scenario is committee based policing. Because that is something which involved the people who were who were working as police. I don't say they were the police, but they were working as police, who were donning the uniform, whatever, working with the community. And that is something which uh, which uh, even in the government, you know, the MI, another thing which was very, very strange was, you know, this was one country where we saw that the political bosses were interfering with the day-to-day -day working of the police service. There was no police head as such. The police was being directly controlled by a political head, by the minister. There were decrees to transfer one private to another uh, police station, you know, signed by the president. 
our, our promotion orders were or transfer orders were signed by president by the president i mean those kind of unprecedented uh, unprecedented things were happening so in this scenario the best possible thing which could have been done was this community oriented policing where the police and we we created that platform not we and a lot of agencies were actually working on that level the the journals like as mentioned they were working in the northern uh, districts we were trying in kabul there were others also were trying so a whole lot of people of course that's another discussion you know what community policing is and how we perceive it and all that because everybody has uh, different perception and different notions about it and even the international community and and more so the the host countries you know and in afghanistan uh, people had different ideas about community policing but the the bottom line was that the community was involved in some way in uh, improving the safety and security of their own areas and somehow we were trying to work as police as partners so that is something which uh, and then the fact that you know little and uh, it was a participatory process it, it provided a platform to a majority of, to the leaders of the community so to say the local leaders of the community that's what we were trying to do and it also involved the women you know it provided a platform to the to the minorities to the women to come and and and, and uh, you know actually present something or their concerns before their elders which was a very very big thing you know mm-hmm. that they could actually stand up uh, in a, in a forum and actually uh, articulate Uh-huh. of the problems that it's all and then those you trying to see how the police and uh, the the community uh, leaders work as one as one platform because the, the problems were were uh, common it was not something which the police alone could address or which was not something which the community alone could address so that kind of a thing which uh, was happening that is there in the community so even if you know like uh, like what we're saying that uh, if things evolve and then and things get better and then if the uh, taliban realize that you know this is uh, how they could perhaps improve the safety and security of the community mm. this is something which the international community could probably push and uh, and leverage on something you know which mm. has already been done because mm. a lot of resources have gone in and a lot of the training has gone in lot of exposure is there mm. so it's not mm. that you know we start a fresh uh, people are aware of it people have uh-huh. worked local people have worked and, and, and so a whole lot of people who st- hopefully are still there who can take on you know once uh, you know mm. they, they, they exactly prove and uh, we are able to uh, sort of talk to yeah. them or the taliban able to engage with the community mm. I I just want, I have one point if if it's okay to add to what sort of says because ahead. because we've been working a lot on this community level but I I think it's worth it to think a little bit also about uh about the at the national level so you have the ministry of interior and I want to say in our research uh, we had on on policing um it, one thing that came out very clear was the value of this mentoring approach in the ministry and this was an area where norway had actually taken uh, uh was was really quite active and it got very good marks in a sense from the afghan side because what happens in those kinds of mentoring situations is that those generals who had no experience in in policing basically they were able to confer with their mentor on everyday issues that came up and also strategic issues how to organize the ministry how to run a meeting and particularly for for women police and women say generals who were promoted into positions in the ministry uh in order to to take responsibility for for human rights and these kinds of issues that they um that they had a colleague in a sense sitting next to them that they could discuss these issues with and that was extremely important for them and that was one thing that we know um uh, was a positive sign of the norwegian uh uh support to police reform that came very clear out in our in our research that that was very worth it and they missed them when they were pulled out because we went and we interviewed and they they missed them because not all of the international community had the same kind of attitude if you're a mentor what does that mean are you a supervisor that tra- jump, you know, comes into the office and says what have you done today you should do this and this and then go out again or is it someone then that actually sits with you and solves these really tricky issues that you don't know how to to solve and um so that's also you know that type of work can also support the process uh, processes that are going on in com- at community levels and the training in a sense that they're able to understand uh what what they gain by having uh, a policing system that is is more focused on uh, uh better better competence at the lower levels in working with with communities so that's like not so the so the international community can play of course many roles but that was anyway one of the roles that we got really positive feedback on uh in our, in our work at the at the national level 
No, I, I can ask <laughs> that because you know I, I uh, met a lot of these uh, police district chiefs, and they they really welcomed you know this kind of a co-location like we call them. We had them in several uh, peacekeeping missions also where professionals actually co-located with the local police and 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 help them in uh, how to actually do the day to day job because they were not exposed to that kind of uh, environment and they were professionally they had you know certain gaps which they, these people could fill, and but they could also. Uh, Uh, fill working within the environment in which they were set it's not something which they would be transporting from outside so it will be, they will be helping them to do how to run a police station how to maintain documents how to maintain you know that kind of a thing so they, they it was a very very useful thing and it it has already uh, been very useful in other peacekeeping missions also it's been very useful mm -hmm. and this is something which could uh, really like uh, you could mention it could be very Uh, it could pay dividends, you know, in the, in the longer run. Also, that you know, we have people, who, people who have been professionally trained, they realize the importance of these things. Like there were a whole lot of uh, officers who have undergone training in different parts of the world, and who have even been trained in the academy in Afghanistan, and who have uh, that exposure to basic police work. So those are the people who really benefit for this, these kind of uh, you know co-locations where they are with the professional police officer and uh, who helps them in in honing the skills in which they have acquired. So I think that can be really mm. something which can be useful in the longer run. Mm. And that probably also means that, hopefully, in a, in the next round, <coughs> that uh, maybe it's not. I mean, what what often can happen in a, say a say post conflict context is that immediately after these conflicts, that those with the most money, in a sense, that are coming in will decide. And that was in one sense what happened in policing at the beginning of the other period is that the, some police reform started and then the the uh, the Americans came in and with all of their money and then pulled the policing training into their direction, which was then this training and. This FTD training or this uh, the, in, in shooting and a sense so they they had like the clout uh, when you have come in with lots of money of course you have a lot of clout maybe maybe not so many um, ties to the money somehow so it, it, in a little different way and so that's something to watch for also now in this new round is like okay because that sets a lot of strategy for what what you can do in 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 assistance and um and who is making decisions about the direction of how aid should be i mean it was definitely at the beginning of the international community that was deciding so many things about how the aid would be organized in policing um without without a lot of uh, um discussions i would say with the, with the afghan counterparts in a sense to make a to make a more cohesive it was like dividing up rather than making a cohesive plan and i don't think that was very wise so maybe this time around if there was more cohesion in the plan in plans for a system as surender was saying like have a really strategic development plan for 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 example the police then then uh, that that could be a step in the right direction but again we don't know what even if, if you know if there's interest in having a police or like what's going to happen now <laughs> we will just have to see and i and i i really feel for for these police that have put already their lives on the line for so many years of uh, being yeah. used as soldiers by the army and now yeah. here they are uh, you know um uh just really not in any uh, any position uh, at all and uh, i think it quite it can be quite scary Uh, uh, if there was anyone who was uh, fighting the Taliban, in a sense, it was it was most likely many of them who were who, who yeah. had been put on the front line. So, so I think, um, and and now it, and women police also. Uh, yeah, we'll see we'll see what happens. Um, difficult position, but but again, we're in a different little bit different place than we were earlier. So, whatever it ends up being now over the next few months of, of decisions about what will happen in the ministry and what will happen with policing, what will happen with women's issues, um, then uh, we'll be able to maybe see where the international community can come in a sense in and negotiate a presence, whether it's in the form of humanitarian aid or in the form of some kind of mentoring or some kind of you know, technical assistance. Uh, uh, then uh, there's always then a better opportunity to make some kind of leeway than there is by by not going in at all. So uh, we will see how it develops. No, I agree with you. See the the kind of uh, effort which the police were doing, or the MP, maybe the kind of support, the kind of training, or the kind of infrastructure they had. I mean, they were their lives were on the line 24 hours. 
mm. a day. And at the same time, whatever they were doing, we we really marveled at them, and we we told them also that you know this is something phenomenal which they were actually just look at the way they were at the checkpoints, 24 hours, 24/7 they were there at checkpoints, and they were big targets. They were sitting ducks for the Taliban, and so many there were so many cases where these checkpoints were overrun by the Taliban, and you know these people were massacred, and yet they were there. This is another uh, interesting point is that you see. The number of police casualties in Afghanistan exceeds the casualties of the army, which is a very strange thing. So the the fact is because that's what I think we did mentioned earlier that you know this military and uh, police the roles are so uh, sort of uh, intermingling. Uh, there was no clear definition between the police role and the military. Hmm. Even in the army. So uh, that is how, unfortunately, even even I mean the international community also played a role in this. You know, by by transferring people or, or supporting people to be transferred from the police to the military and vice versa and all that, which is something uh, like uh, <laughs> you already pointed out that we are trying to find a military solution to a police issue. We are trying to, uh, and then uh, you rightly mentioned that uh, people came with a lot of money, and then you know, then they started calling the shots, and then ultimately the whole uh, you know project, the program was diverted in a particular direction, and you know, so that's what I mentioned when I mentioned about a clear uh, a vision. You know, when, uh, we need to have a vision for the country and along with the people who are involved, and uh, we have to find a solution, a Afghan solution to Afghan problem. We can't find a NATO solution or a you know, uh, uh, whatever, all of us tried. It's not that people didn't try. Uh, even the international people put their lives on the line. It was not that people have died and people have, uh, my own colleague died in, in UDP. I mean, so it, it's not that we all didn't take the risk and we didn't try. We did try. But unfortunately, the effort was not integrated and not coordinated. So we were not able to uh, deliver and achieve the kind of results which we should have, you know, the kind of resources, mm -hmm. the kind of expertise, and the kind of, uh, you know, wherewithal we had at our uh, command. So I, I fully agree with you, you know, that uh, when we uh, go in next time or in any other, uh, in a similar environment, I think it's very, very important to have some sort of a framework which is uh, you know decided in advance that okay like policing we will help the police fine like in what we need to have this 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 we need to have a properly recruited people who are educated who are this 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 whatever maybe i'm just you know saying these things at the cup but we can draw some sort of fundamentals you know that we need to have this for support we, we supported the women police uh, i mean we, uh, our, my organization supported the women police but ultimately what happened the police were trained. We trained 1,500 police. Not a single one of them was on the police station. You know, when, whenever we visited the police station, they used to come wear the uniform and sit. No, they never wore the uniform. They never uh, were. They, uh, they had the confidence to walk out on the streets wearing the uniform. So, what was the use of training them? So, it's uh, what we uh, the the. Uh, international community could have done was that okay if you are training them then we also have to put pressure on the ministry of interior or the minister the administration department there that okay we utilize these uh, women who've been trained in police work but again then the tradition the culture and you know so many other things come into play so that's why we need to have an afghan we, we need to orient our uh, approach towards development, towards policing, towards security, whatever, in the local milieu. We cannot do something which we would do in any other country, you know. So even if there are examples from other countries, it's not that we can just extrapolate those examples as they were or as they happened in that particular country because again the local environment becomes very important like you mentioned about the taliban the taliban are being you know uh, welcomed in certain parts of the thing despite the fact that they've been they committed so many atrocities so in this case also the local uh, environment is such that people relate to that more than what they relate to people, even though we think that what we were doing was right, but they felt no, it's not the case. It's an outside, uh, you know, concept. Mm -hmm. So why should we accept it? You know. So those are issues I think which we really need to. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I'm saying again, I come back to the same thing that you know, the community-based policing is the only answer to the, in the next few years. Before, you know, we we sort out these issues of recruitment. We sort out. Uh, we are talking about democratic policing, but the police has to be democratic. It has to be represented. Where's the fundamental of democratic policing? It has to be representative. But in the in, uh, case of Afghanistan, there was, I mean, this is far from the truth. Because people were, uh, there was tribalism, there was factionalism, there was the warlords were sending people even to the academy, and uh, all sorts of things <laughs> were happening. So anyway, uh, then expecting them to deliver is something, uh, you know, even if you have the best possible instructors, best possible equipment, and whatever infrastructure, you cannot. 
because the raw material has to be you know it, it should have that acumen it should have that kind of basic ingredients you know which can be converted into something professional you know, rather than just trying to convert like you can't teach all correct new tricks you know, it's like that <laughs> time is unfortunately uh running out and i don't see that there's any more questions that have been sent uh in but uh, i would like to give you the opportunity if there's a small point that you want to add that you haven't uh, had the opportunity to say yet uh if there's any sort of last minute points that you want to make before we finalize uh. <laughs> uh, well, I personally would like, at least in, in, in the context of uh, Norwegian aid in Afghanistan, uh, that there actually is attention to these kinds of community issues rather than channeling all the funding to uh, multilateral organizations in a sense that one takes a, li a better look at the opportunities of, of really supporting uh, community uh, development uh, and also policing and policing is seen it's seen more as something that's different than the military and different than NATO. And I think it's been quite invisible, unfortunately, in, in the, at least in the Norwegian, uh, until now, exactly now, uh, there has been very, very little focus on what that, what policing uh, means and what a police, uh, uh, what support to the police might mean. And it was only used as a political uh, uh, move rather than uh, actually what it uh, what it represented and what it could represent by supporting a different kind of of or p supporting uh, the communities and policing differently than was done in the in the earlier uh, way. Mm. 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 Very you, you important be. point. Very very important, and I I think it's it's perhaps one of the most important things which need to be considered before you know we uh, pump in resources. Because resources uh, were never an issue. It was not that they, we didn't have the resources, but unfortunately they were channelized in such a direction where they did fail to achieve you know, anything. And, uh, and, and another thing is that we knew, the international community was aware. It was not that you know, uh, they were not aware of what was happening on the ground. They were, uh, there was so much of duplication. There was so much of you know, unintegrated, uncoordinated efforts. People were giving uh, stuff which was absolutely finding its, uh, I mean, useless and finding its way in the market. People were selling it, and, and you know, actually, we contributed to uh, the corruption levels, and we contributed to, uh, you see, uh, not knowingly, but unknowingly. You see, we contributed a lot towards uh, making people, you know, make a fast buck at somebody else's expense. Because all the, the a guy, imagine a person, I mean, you're providing laptops, you're providing printers, you're providing all sorts of stuff which the guy doesn't even know how to open, you know. What is he going to do? If somebody gives him even $100 for it, he'll, he'll take that. And that's what happened, you know. So that's why it's important that, you know, whenever, especially Norway, Norway has been a very, very important uh, contributor and, and a very, very good donor. Like I said, I, I worked in several countries and I realized and worked with, and uh, if you find that even the contribution from Norway has always been uh, phenomenal and it is uh, one of the best donors you, the development agencies look at. You know. From that point of view, I think, uh, but you also have the kind of leverage, uh, you know, which I think you should exercise when it comes to uh, providing resources, you know, to these countries that, okay, these are the the, the basic fundamentals or principles, you know, which you need to adhere to before we start pumping money or we start it. Like you said, but uh, it's easier said than done because it's political, you know, there are so many things politically which we cannot control. But the fact of it is that, you know, there are certain things which if there are, if there's a way of controlling, it will be good, you know, because you will make better use of the taxpayers' money and uh, which will end up in actually uh, helping people who are in need rather than, you know, just uh, you know, like That's the European very... Union, I'll give an example. You know, the European Union made a, a women's uh, hostel, a huge women's hostel in the police academy, four story hostel, and not a single woman was trained. Not a single woman. We sent from our organization, we sent women to Turkey to train. And then we flew instructors from Afghanistan to Turkey to train them in uh, <laughs> you know, the police work, which they could have done here. So, you know, those kind of things are there. Anyway. That is something which uh, is something which is uh, you know separate discussion can always we can have a separate discussion on that but that is uh, something which really really the donors uh, need to look at you know pledge funds. True, true, and those are are big discussions and um, 
uh, there, there's a lot more to discuss here as well, but unfortunately the time is up um, for this seminar today. So I would really like to thank you both, uh, Ingrid and Surendra, for taking the time to, to be with us here today and share your knowledge and experience. It was really a pleasure to, to listen to you. And I also want to thank um, our colleagues uh, at NUPI, Gabriella and Osman, for helping us with the, with the technical parts and the logistical parts uh, in this new digital world. So a large thanks, um, thanks to you. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this um, will be uploaded to the consortium webpage and be available uh, shortly after we're done here, if you want to see it again. So um, again, Large thanks to, to our two presenters and also to the audience for, for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you soon in the new upcoming seminars that the consortium has. So uh, bye for now. My apologies <laughs> for the technical glitches. <laughs> <laughs>